Yeah, what great testimonies, huh? Isn't Jesus good? Like, like that's such an understatement. What a great testimony. While, her, while she was sharing, her husband was sitting right beside me. So when they yelled out, you're standing. I said, was she able to stand like that before? She said, oh, no, 30 seconds max. That's her hubby said. He said, we've been praying for this for a long, long time. Isn't it beautiful? So it's just believe in God, yeah? It's just believe in God. So, so believe in God. Let me just expound on this since the excitement of all this is, and I was sharing this with them yesterday, and even corporately because we did that. Yeah, that's right. We put you on the spot. Everybody pray. And uh, <laughs> isn't that so fun? <laughs> Believing is a verb. It's not a point in time. It's a position of the heart. You believe. What some people do is they say they believe a promise or a scripture, so they try it. They don't see the fruit, so then they change what they believe. Ah. Are you following me? So when it comes to healing, believing, we're not running a risk. It's not hit, miss, win, or lose. It's not make it or break it. It's not willy or won't he. You actually see the heart of God through the son crucified and raised from the dead through the word of God. And you actually believe what he paid for. And you position yourself to receive that through believing. And if you see nothing change, you have one response as a Christian. One one response as a Christian. (laughs) Thank you, Father. You're so good. I so appreciate your love for me. And I so appreciate what you're doing in my body and in my life. Thank you. That's where a Christian lives. Right? Not complaining, and why isn't this working, and what door did I open, and why is God allowing, and what? And all of a sudden, you got 13 questions that are trying to cloud out the thing that your heart wants to know. You following what I'm saying? So what a good testimony. What a good learning example. I'm so, so thankful that Jesus will teach us this way, and that we'll see a lady say, man, you know what? It ain't all the way there, but there's peace there. I can't even explain it. It's like, and you know what she's trying to say. She feels different. There's stability. There's strength. She's standing. She's walking. Hubby says she wouldn't have stood like that for 30 seconds. I'm excited. Yeah. It's coming through believing. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So guess where we're going? Where are we going? I have some believers that are probably wondering. <laughs> no, we're going there. Let's go to Colossians. Let's, let's go. This is where I wanted to go this morning, but we went wherever we went this morning. I'm not sure where that was. It seemed intense. You guys were okay, though, right? It seemed intense, though. I could feel intensity. And, but, but you guys were okay. You seemed really okay. Like, you're just like, bring it. So, the, 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 so I'm talking about relationship, communion with God, and fellowship with God. It's very, 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 very important to get to know the Lord and commune with Him and like when you, get a, when you get a good friend and you become really good friends, you didn't become really good friends because you didn't hang out. Come on, this stuff is not rocket science. Like, like you guys are married. You didn't, it didn't just didn't happen. Like, well, nowadays some of that stuff happens, like internet brides and stuff, I guess. But you guys got to know each other. And you got to fellowship together, get to know each other. And all of a sudden you think, yeah, I, man, I, Wow hey, would you marry me? Whoa, yeah. And then all of a sudden you're getting joined in front of family and friends. Why? Because you develop a relationship and you come to know in your heart, man, I want to marry you, right? So you don't drive in a car with a friend. I know you won't if you're in my car. You won't drive with a friend for 50 miles and not talk. I'm talking. (laughs) Well, I don't have a need to talk. I'll ask you questions. I'll get to know you. If we're driving in a car together... Who, what friends in here drive together in a car for even 15 minutes and don't communicate? I'm just being relatable and real with you guys. I'm giving you some examples. But how many times do we drive in a car and we got worship songs playing but don't even talk to Jesus? And we let the worship song take the place of relationship and fill the gap of time or noise or space. Or... I know that's not our intention, that's not why we turned it on. We liked the song. But my goodness, take every opportunity to be with him, to communicate with him. 
You hear a song that catches your heart and touches your heart. People have favorite songs. I know I'm not a real favorite kind of guy. I don't, that's, I'm a little different. I don't have favorite color, favorite number, favorite. I just love color. I like, I like songs. I, you say, what's my favorite scripture? I have no clue. Like, if I think I have one, a hundred more just bombard me. So every good scripture, I call it to my top hundred. <laughs> yeah, every awesome scripture, I'm like, that is in my top hundred. <laughs> but relationship with Jesus second to none. So the reason I wanted to go to Colossians, I wanted to start a little track this morning, but I think we'll do it this afternoon because I think I pruned you guys enough. I think we did. I think we pruned you guys this morning. Last night was good. We had the clippers out last night. <laughs> I could feel it the whole time. I mean, I had one of them lobbers, man. I was, I was like, I felt it, man. I was like, this is good. Because the last two sessions, if you weren't here, all we really established was the reason Jesus sent his son and died on the cross. It wasn't just to forgive you and take, to he- take you to heaven. It was to put heaven in you, to transform you, to get you back to what God intended in the first place. That's gotten missed my whole life as a Christian. I went to church till I was 20, and nobody taught me that. Everybody preached the cross. I saw crucifixion movies. Everybody said I was a sinner. I needed forgiven, and he died on the cross to forgive me. Nobody said he died on the cross to restore me and to restore truth and to put purpose back in my life and to give me destiny. So they just left me a hopefully forgiven sinner that really had no hope or no purpose or no chance to change. And then God was a mystery because it's amazing he loves somebody like me. Not that we earn or work into his love. We receive his love, but receiving his love begins to change our lives, puts integrity back in us, builds character back up. When you see his first love, you love him. Jesus said, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments, and his commandments aren't burdensome. You see how relationship works? I'm not keeping his commandments to try to prove my love. I see his first love, and I love him, and keeping his commandments is simple. Why? Because I honor him. I respect the person of God. Nobody's loved me like he's loved me. Like nobody has come into my life and treated me like God has treated me. And give me the access to the kingdom. Put his life inside me. When I didn't earn a thing, I just received what was paid for. That's incredible. Like, like all we do is get to a place where we repent. We're sorry for the life we live. We're sorry for the choices we've made. We're sorry for the mistakes. We're sorry, and we're sincerely sorry, but we can't go back and change it. Regret would eat us alive. We can't just change ourselves. But man, if we're just sorry, and all of a sudden he forgives us of our sins, puts new life in us. We begin to grow in understanding. You get a whole new living way. All of a sudden, our motives are different. Our purpose is different. Our perspective is different. The why in our life is different. Just, just anybody that's just here that hasn't been here those last two sessions, that's where we've been the last two sessions. So the cross of Jesus Christ is not paid in full and fulfilled when a man prays a prayer to go to heaven someday. The cross of Christ is fulfilled and paid in full when his nature is restored back to love and he's following Jesus and walking in the light as Jesus is in the light. That's when the cross is fulfilled. Forgiveness of sin is not the end. It's the very beginning. It just accesses you back to the Father so that you can have relationship with the Father. So forgiveness of sin is mighty and powerful and excited about it. But we make that the whole goal. The goal is not forgiveness. The goal is transformation through the forgiveness. Are you with me? So please don't sell it any cheaper than that. Christianity is a big deal, and it's impossible to live on your own. The Christian life is impossible. Without the person of Holy Spirit, you're not going to fulfill Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes. and You're not going to walk out the commandments of the Lord in your flesh. But yet he commands it. And yet he tells us to follow him. You can't follow him on your own. You can't just say, okay, you can't listen to this sermon last night and say, okay, I'm ramped up. I'm going to do it. It's grace that changes us. It's you getting alone with God when nobody's looking, friend, and saying, man, you know what? I believe you love me. I believe you, have, you see value when you see me because you see purpose and potential. And the life I was living was a zero, but you want to make it count. You want to make it worth something to where when time expires on this natural life, there's something to remember for eternity. Man, I want to live a legacy before you, God. But more even than that, I want to burn a legacy in the hearts of men that somehow they get to know you a little more because I got to know you some. And you talk to him like that, and you get real, and you begin communing and relating and talking, and you're hearing these songs, and you're listening to a sermon, and you're interjecting, communicating, and talking. Guys, that's how you get to know somebody. Yeah? Yeah. You ask him to teach you, 
and, 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 and ask him to give you understanding. And you ask him to begin to form these things in you because it's so what you want to live. And here's how it works. Any teacher in here knows that scripture says this. You're saved by grace through Okay, so grace is God's working power. Grace is God's ability. Grace isn't a permission slip. There's a weird teaching of grace out there that just says, hey, thank God for grace. Like, hey, boy, I sure blew up on my spouse this morning. Thank God for grace. No, grace keeps you from blowing up. Grace isn't a permission slip. It's not a smooth over. Grace and mercy are two different things. Grace is empowerment. Grace is God's willingness to use his power on your behalf to empower you to be something you can never be on your own. That's what grace is. So if you're saved by grace through faith, every time you apply faith to the truth about what he paid for in your life, grace comes to meet that faith and make that truth your reality without you biting your lip trying to change. It's not you trying to love better. It's you becoming love. It's not you trying to forgive. It's you becoming forgiveness. Because you've been alone with God and you see the truth, how he sees you through love and how he hasn't hold it, held anything. He's forgiven you of everything. He hasn't held anything in front of you like that. He didn't, well, where, well, how come you did? Well, I'll never forget. Well, you remember the time? He doesn't do that to any of us. Whoever came to God in a sincere heart of repentance and got met by God sitting with his arms crossed saying, oh, it's you. How long have I been drawing you and you finally show up now? Six months ago, you had the best crack I ever gave you and you ignored me. You caused a lot of hell in the last six months and you hurt a lot of people, not to mention me. I'll tell you what, I'm not even sure where we stand anymore and if I can even trust you. I'll talk to the 24 hours. I'll get back to you tomorrow and see where we stand. (laughs) Have we dealt with each other that way? He hasn't dealt with any of us that way. I was so lost the night I got saved. I was so arrogant in my own mind. I was so deceived. And he saved me. He knocked on my heart. He came to me. It changed me forever. Because I saw I was unlovely. And he said, that's not what I love about you. I love you. And I know what you can be if I'm in you and you surrender. And I paid for it love you. And I yielded myself and surrendered myself and he came inside of me and he began to teach me this gospel. That I'll be honest, I'm not being mean, I'm not being arrogant and I'm not mad at nobody, but no preacher in my life ever told me Jesus died on the cross to restore me as a son. They all said he died on the cross because I was a loser. You better believe he had to die because I sinned. My sin cost him death. But he didn't die because I'm a sinner. He died because something was lost and he wanted to restore it. Why we struggle with that message and think it's high-minded or think it's men speaking too highly of themselves. He's the one that came as a man. Pretty radical thought that God would put himself in the womb of a woman. Do you think about this stuff or is it just a story? Is it just Bible? Is it just Easter thing? Or is it Christmas? Come on, be real with me. God put himself in the womb of a woman and hung out there for nine months and was born of her. Came through her birth canal. Wore those little swaddling clothes and was totally dependent on a woman. That's a major mind blower to me. That's more than inconvenience. Come on, if you're God, you're God. You're the one that was and is and is to come. Nothing was made that wasn't made through you. And now you're in the womb of a woman that you made. Come on, that speaks loud to me. And I'm just going to talk about it, you know? Like God put himself in the womb of a woman and was born of a, a woman so he could come as a man, so he could redeem man, so he could fulfill what man failed, do it as a man, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Fulfill all righteousness so you and I don't have to come through the law and come through perfection. We can come through him. He must really want us back to the Father. And more than that, the Father must really, really, really want us back to him. So I'm just done with this false humility language. 
Well, it's a wonder God considers us. He considered you before the foundation of the world. What are you talking about? You were predestined to be born and adopted in as a son. I'll calm down. I'm not mad at people. I'm mad at these lies. These lies are like, the religious stuff that never produced life in no one. And they contest the truth and keep the truth blinded in our hearts so we never walk in the measure of grace that's available to change us. Yeah. I know you, I know it'll sound arrogant to some. Some people hear what you're not saying. You can say anything you want about what I'm preaching, but you'll find out one day. And that I'm convinced. Because it says one day when he appears, you will appear with him. See, there's something about knowing him and not just having theology that you can't take from a person. There's a confidence in knowing him. When you know you're hearing his voice, when his presence is on you in the early morning hours, when you hear him in the middle of the night. Yeah? How? Yeah, that's how I feel. I'm just playing it cool because I'm supposed to preach and I'm supposed to be okay. But I'm borderline hanging on right now. <laughs> like, how do you take knowing away from someone? You can't. Well, you weren't hearing God's voice all those years. Okay. See, it's just not easy. It's just not easy. You're not going to take away my relationship. You can criticize it. You can judge it. You can say it's something else. You can do all you want. But I was the one in that relationship for the last 26 years. It's where my confidence comes from. It's where my boldness comes from. See, confidence we mistake for arrogance. You're not supposed to throw away your confidence. Your confidence has great reward. Because you have need of endurance. So after the will of God is done, you can receive the promise. That's Hebrews 10, 35, and 6. It's there. I read it. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with confidence. Which sounds like there's more to the Christian life than being forgiven. You have need of endurance, which means things are coming against your person, your family, your circumstances, but they're not directed to cause you hardship. They're directed to crush your thinking towards the kingdom, to get you discouraged, to get you to back step and to turn tail and run, to get you to not continue to grow. The adversity is intended to stop the kingdom, not just crush your family. I talked about it this morning. You gotta make sure you don't take adversity personal. And the only way to do that is because you already took the gospel personal. And you're not a product of what you're going through. You're a product of what he went through. And you're wearing what he paid for every day. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Sorry, I feel so aggressive. I can't. It just comes. You say, oh, well, you, can. you have no idea until you're in my shoes. And this, this stuff comes on me. It comes like a freight train. And <laughs> can you tell that I'm not just prepared for what I'm saying? I don't even know what I'm doing in the next minute. I'm on a journey with you. And I like it. I'm trying to read Colossians. You see what happens? And then, and I don't even know what just happened. It's not funny. It is funny. It is funny. No, it's funny. It's hard to say some of this stuff because we've been taught by religious sayings and hearings and so Jesus said as I hear I speak if a person would declare that oh my goodness but let me go ahead and wing it I actually believe that's what happens to me when I preach so everybody that disagrees with me now they're they're affirming my heresy all the more because <laughs> now I'm affirming I hear the voice of God but I believe that's what happens to me when I preach because I have no need to preach guys I'm here because I want to did you hear last? I, I, I paid for my plane ticket here. I take zero honorarium from Cityquake, and I covered my hotel room. So I'm close, so I'm close to $1,000 in, close, just to be here, asking for nothing from anyone. Why? Because I believe what I preach, 
and I believe it'll make a difference in people's lives. And it's not a business deal, and I'm not here for finances. I'm not here earning a living. I'm alive. Are you following me? So that just changes things. I'm not here to impress you. I'm impressed <laughs> with the one that I've known and been in relationship with. But when you see me kneel during worship, you know what I'm saying every time, and it's not religious. I say, Lord, you know my heart. I have no need to preach. I have no need to stand in front of anybody. I'm not trying to build a ministry. I'm not trying to build a kingdom. I just want to minister the one that's here. I'm not trying to be somebody. I don't need to be known. You know my heart, God. They're going to hand me a mic in a little bit. You know this room through and through. You know this room in detail. If they handed you a mic in the next 10 minutes, you know exactly what you'd say if you stood in front of this room. Would you let that be the only words that come out of my mouth? And then I get up here and I think I'm reading some, and then I go... You can hear how fast I'm talking. It just comes. It's not premeditated. I go from one topic to the next... No, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to explain that there's something about knowing him and having a pure motive and not just doing ministry and not just trying to pray for the sick to see somebody healed, not just trying to get a word of knowledge to feel spiritual or like you can hear God's voice. Guys, there's something about knowing him that changes everything. Changes everything. Nobody can talk you out of that. Nobody can take your relationship. But here's the thing. I can't impart it. I can talk about it. I can impart the knowledge of it. But people say, I want what you have. Lay hands on me. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. The impartation message, there's a truth to it, but it's a very narrow truth. I think it's a very wide thing in the church, but it's a very narrow truth. The, the examples of impartation was always with strong purpose. Joshua had wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. I get it. But it was so that he could step into Moses' shoes and do what Moses was doing. It doesn't mean that everybody Moses would have laid hands on would have walked in that wisdom. So sometimes I think we misguide that. And it, it, if we're not careful, we're just trying to get impartation, impartation from everybody that we see that has something that maybe I haven't walked in. So we want them to pray for me. But why would you rob yourself of knowing him? Why don't you just go to him? Go to him. I understand Paul and Timothy and he wanted to deposit a gift. I, I, I've read it all. I get it all. But it was always with purpose and it was always for leadership and to step into a position that I can't lay hands on you and impart to you the relationship that I have with Jesus. But boy, I hope I can inspire your heart to go be with him. Because it's the change of your life. Like there's nothing like knowing him. There's nothing like waking up in the morning and just being totally okay. Like just totally okay because he's here. He's in you and it's like, yay. This is what I wanted to talk about this stuff for. So I hope we're leading up to it because I really feel like I'm supposed to do it. The Lord said to me a long time ago, you won't totally understand this, but I can explain it. But he said to me a long time ago, do you know why you live the way you do? I knew what he meant right away because he said it to me. Because there was things on my heart when he said it. Consistency, never trying. It makes some people frustrated when you say Christianity is so simple. Like, I've been saved 26 years. I'm telling you the truth, guys. I, there's, not, there's, not, there's no struggle to being loved by God. There's no struggle to being a Christian, living Christ. I think there's a struggle with remaining self-conscious, having wrong identity, taking things personal, needing affirmation. I think those things we keep alive, and that's where the struggle is. Because we think that's all normal, but that was Adam. You're born again. The Lord said, do you know why you live the way you do? And I said, yes, because your mercy is amazing and you're awesome and you're an incredible, loving God. And I started to say just what you just said. And I felt like I heard the Lord chuckle in my heart and say, that's not the answer I'm looking for. And I would have said what you would have said. That's the only answer. You are what you are by the grace of God. 
If a man has some, it's been given. There's no boasting in men. He said, nope, not the answer I'm looking for. I'm like, it's the only answer. <laughs> he said, Dan, everything you're praising me for, everything you're saying I am is who I am. But watch this, you get this. It needs a place to land in your life. It's one thing to say, Pastor, that God's merciful. It's another thing if you receive the mercy of God. Do you know that God's merciful and there's people that won't receive mercy? Do you know God's loving and forgiving and people won't receive forgiveness, won't forgive themselves? Do you know that God through the cross is saying you're worth it and there's people that are saying they can't be? So I guess we do participate, don't we? I could say God loves you all day and I'm right every time I say it. But until you receive and believe the love of God, you won't benefit from that truth. And you'll live as if you're unloved. That's why the just live by faith. That's why it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, when we hear please God without faith, we hear displeasure if we don't have faith. It's not displeasure in the way he wants to cut you off or he's mad at you or he's scorning. What it means is he can't, he can't enjoy the pleasure of a father's heart when a son's walking in fruition. We hear displeasure all the time when we hear God's not pleased. We hear displeasure. I don't think it's always the case. He said, do you know why you live the way you do? I said, yeah, because you're amazing. Your grace is sufficient. You're incredible, merciful God. He said, that's not the answer. I said, it's the only answer. He said, Dan, it needs a place to land. He said, let me tell you why you live the way you do. He said, the night you got saved, you saw your need for me. You saw your sinful life. You saw your heart. You were sin conscious. And you were like, oh, my and you looked at me, he said, but you were only sin conscious for that moment until you repented and yielded to me. But he said, ever since that moment, Dan, this was years ago, ever since that moment, you've been a son in your heart and you never went back to that sin conscious. And he said, and everything you're praising me to be is always landing on your life. So you wake up knowing who I am and knowing who you are in me. Every single day, there's a consistent truth that's alive in my heart that sets the tone Every day, whether my wife's in identity crisis for eight years, whether my kids were running wild at the same exact time, whether my mother was dying of a sickness. Can you see any of that in me? Can you see any of that testimony in me when I'm talking? Can you see my wife in a coma on life support with brain damage? Do you see that? <laughs> You're never supposed to see that. Because it's never about the fire you've been through. It's about the Lord that you bow to. It wasn't about Shadrach's fire. It wasn't about Nebuchadnezzar's fire. It wasn't about Meshach's trial. It was about their non-compromise. They won't call something Lord that's not. And it wasn't about the fire burning or going out. It was about them never changing. Because if it was about the fire, Jesus would have put it out right away. You know what he did? He stepped in the middle of it and left to keep burning. <laughs> Unbound his boys and made sure they were free in the middle of the trial. And left it rage the whole time. Till old Nebby caught view and said, what, Shaq? Come on out of there. It's the veggie tails. Shaq, right. <laughs> Benny, come out of the fire. You ever see it? Oh, it's so powerful, man. <laughs> it's Veggie Tales. When the light shoots down into there and all the light comes out, I cry. I'm like, my little granddaughter sit with me and she's little, and I'm like, I know, the, I know what's about to happen because we watched it like 25 times. So I'm crying as soon as they show the furnace. It's Veggie Tales, but it's truth. He's about to come into their fire. They won't sacrifice, or they won't, they won't compromise. They won't, they won't bow to something that's not Lord. And they don't, it's, it's not about them dying. It's about them living in honor. They're not scared. They're not scared for their lives. It's, they're not in survival mode. You gotta be very careful in today's Christian world that you're just not a Christian to make it, whatever that means. And that it's just all about you and your sentiments and your family and your ducks in a row and your IRA and your protected family. 
And that if one thing ruffles, you fall apart and don't even know how to pray and got so many questions and wonder where God is. You never understood in the first place why you are what you say you are. And that's not cool because it's not your fault because you might not have been taught and you didn't understand. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire. There ain't no smell of smoke. You can't even tell they were in there, but I'll bet they were passionate. I bet they weren't passive. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did you see that, Benny? Yeah, that was something. <laughs> You're not calming the dudes down. Nebuchadnezzar was so freaked out, he didn't quite catch the idea. He's going to kill everybody that doesn't bow to his image, right? And he's going to throw them all in the fire. Now, he's going to throw anybody in the fire that doesn't bow to Shackrack and Benny's God. So now he's still going to throw you in the fire, but it's if you don't. It must have been a pretty radical thing. See, these aren't just Bible stories. This stuff happened to people. And these three Hebrew boys had the honor of saying, King, what's your fire to us? You can't threaten us with our lives. We love not our own lives under death. We're not going to compromise and bow to you and live with that on our conscience when we know he's the Lord. And you know what? If he chooses not to save us from your fire, I'll tell you what, he's still the Lord. Nevertheless, our God will deliver us from your fire. <laughs> you got to love that. See, see, I don't know if you pay attention to this stuff. The, the king's decree was so urgent that when the guards of the king opened the door to throw Shackrack and Benny in there, what happened? Toasty bacon, man. <laughs> they opened the door and got consumed by the heat of the fire. Let me ask you a question. So how'd Shackrack and Benny even get in the flames? How'd they get in the furnace if the guys that were going to put them in got devoured? No, I don't think they walked in. I think Jesus said, this is going to be fun. <laughs> they're bound head to foot. They can't even see. They're completely bound. They don't even know where they're at. They can feel the heat. They didn't walk in the furnace. Somebody knocked them in there. And it wasn't those two guards. Now, don't take that as theological absolute. I'm telling you, I have fun with that. I think Jesus said, I like you boys. Living in an old covenant under a law of sin and death, and you got a revelation that I'm king and Lord of all. Tell you what. See, he didn't, if he'd have put out the fire, that would make the fire intimidating. He didn't put out the fire, that would make the fire better and Lord over the men. He left the fire burning to prove a point. He's Lord over everything. They're in the fire. He didn't keep them out of the fire. They went right in the middle of it. You ever been in the middle of a trial? You ever go through something you were hoping you didn't have to or believing you weren't? Make sure you don't change your mind about truth. Oh, that's just good, solid preaching right there, man. Come on. I've pastored long enough to know that people let what they're going through decide who they are and how they are. We ask Christians, how you doing? And our answer is the two biggest trials and keep me in prayer. Come on. Them boys didn't have a problem. They had an answer. We're not people loaded down with a hundred different problems, guys. We got one amazing answer. Amen. And it's Christ in us. Amen. And you're supposed to never again fear. He says, fear not. I didn't ever study this out. But I heard preachers say it, but I never studied it out. But they said there's 365 fear nots or don't be afraid in your Bible. That's one for every day. So it's like God has all the bases covered. Fear not, don't be afraid. So you can grab one in a daily devotion. Grab a fear not or don't be afraid and have one for every day. So when are you ever to be afraid? Never. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear involves torment and whatnot. Are you kidding? Our lives are sealed, man. Sentiment's a big enemy to the church, human sentiment. A lot, of us, a lot of us get tricked into our whole prayer life is just God taking care of our family and everyone that concerns us and protecting. It's not wrong to have a, a general faith about that and believe that, but make sure you're on the earth to shine. Make sure you're on the earth to walk in love. Make sure you value other people's children as much as you value yours because they're worth the same. Come on, if God's not biased, why are we? So we think our family's more important than the neighbor's? You're supposed to love your neighbor as your? 
Greater love hath no man than this. He laid down his life for his. I got enough scripture on this. And you just can't talk me out of it. Y'all good? So this goes to my point on Colossians chapter (laughs) 1. That if we don't start developing a relationship and spend time with God and see ourselves how he sees us. How are we going to run this race worthy of a prize? Won't we grow weary and well-doing? Won't lies sneak up and trip us and stumble us and buy time we don't have to give? Won't you find yourself going through a season of wrong believing and then waking up one day and going, oh, man, how did I? uh," And then you get bummed out and then you let another season go by because you're bummed out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We tried to touch this this morning. I feel confident we're touching it now. You who were once alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he's reconciled. That's Colossians 1.21. So I want you to understand that you're in my mind. We're working contrary to the kingdom and everything the kingdom represents. He's not just talking about gross sin. He's talking about self-centeredness. Your mind and my mind was hinged in the wellspring of self-centeredness. That's why your emotional makeup was the way it was when you were born. When you were born into Adam, the emotions you had, there's nobody in this room. Nobody in this room that can't understand this. We were born and we had no identity. We had no clue who we were. None of us. You needed love, support, stability. You needed the right elements to make you okay. And a lot of us didn't have most of those elements. So then our past becomes our story and I'm this way because of this. And that becomes our lifelong testimony. Who knows I'm telling the truth? Watch. At a very young age, you're no more than how you responded to how it unfolded. And you find that as your identity. And it's never the truth about you. You're in third grade, they're laughing at you. You thought they were your friends and now you realize they're not laughing with you, they're laughing at you in a fun making way. And you're old enough to perceive it. And you're like, so now you're faced with choices. You can get introverted, broken, insecure, and low esteem, or you can harden up, toughen up, and fight. No matter how you respond, it's not you. And you go on living your life, well, I'm this way, well, I'm this way. No, you were fashioned that way through the fall of man, through sin, through deception, through happenings. But then Christ comes. The way comes. The truth and the life comes. And he sells, he shows you through his sacrifice who you really are and what you can really be. And all of a sudden you say death to all the things that ever were, forgiveness to everyone that ever did, and forgiveness to me. I'm going to call it all dead. You go get water baptized and you die in the likeness of his death and die to sin once and for all. And you come up even as God raised Jesus by the glory of the Father. So you shall raise in the newness of life. That's Christian right there. That's Christian. And then he gets to Romans 6.10 and he says, so the death Jesus died, he died once, once to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, likewise you, likewise you, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Remember that phrase I used, false humility? Here's a false humility. Well, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. Everybody's sinning. We're probably sinning right now. We just don't even realize you're probably sinning all the time. How do you reckon yourself dead to sin and boast in your ability to commit it and call it humility? First Peter 2. He bore your sin, my sin, and his body on a tree. Why? That we having died to Sin might live for, and by his stripes were healed. How can you die to sin, the mentality, the sting, the stain, the regret, the desire, the compulsion? How can you die to that identity and still proclaim it on your life daily? The Bible specifically says to wake up every day and do not present your members as instruments for unrighteousness but present your members as instruments for for righteousness, which produces its fruit to holiness. Come on, it's all scripture. It's all there. And it's almost hard to preach this stuff. Like people are like, well, yeah, but what are you saying? Like, what are you saying? You're perfect? I'm saying I've been made right in the sight of God. And I live from that place. And that place inspires me to live beyond what I was ever capable because grace is working through faith. Are you following? 
And all of a sudden, there's things in my life I would have wrestled with before. There's attitudes and feelings and emotions that would have been a challenge to me. And all of a sudden, they're not even relevant to me because of what I see now, because of where I live from now, because of where I'm motivated now. So I'm not trying to not be hurt, because if you're trying to not be hurt, you're hurt. If you're trying to forgive, you're in unforgiveness. I'm done living in that realm. I don't want a grid for unforgiveness if all he does is forgive me. He says a servant that can't forgive a brother is an evil and wicked servant who wants to be forgiven of everything he ever owed and did that was outside of God, and then he can't forgive his brother for something he did. If you took that, that currency in that parable in Matthew 18, that story, took the currency, you're talking millions and millions of dollars and a few hundred bucks. So the servant was forgiven millions and millions of dollars of debt by the master, and he choked his fellow servant for like 500 bucks and had him thrown in prison, which means it's really, it's it's talking this place. He shut him up in his, he shut him in his heart as a debtor. You know what the servant, the servants of the master said, hey, this guy that you forgave everything, he... The master came and he said, what is this you've done, you evil and wicked servant? That's intense language, guys. What's he saying? You want to receive something from me that you're not willing to become. Come on, it's the whole goal of the cross. It's multiplication. Eat seed after its own kind. Jesus was a seed that fell on the ground and sprung up and he's bearing much fruit. Christ in us. After his own kind. The body of Christ. The master said, you evil and wicked servant, you want to receive something you're not willing to become? You want me to forgive you of all this you owed me, and you can't forgive your brother for that? Guess what happened to him? Bound, tormented, outer darkness. That's a solical place of duress. That's a place of mental duress. That's a place of, that's not cool. Because you're living outside of your creative value, and you got things harbored in your heart that you were never created to harbor and it's a place of torment. Who can tell me that they were ever in unforgiveness and can tell me they were blessed and producing fruit for the kingdom? Who can tell me that you were angry, offended, or frustrated at anyone and you were producing great fruit for the kingdom and bearing witness of the nature of God? You see, it's a terrible trap to live in that and think it's normal because it stops the expression of him. So don't you come up with a right good enough Don't you justify your story good enough to be found outside of looking like Jesus? Well, I'd be if it wasn't for, well, you don't know what they put me through, brother. Well, you're telling me that if you, and all of a sudden you're justifying not looking like him, making the thing that happened Lord and rule and dominate your life, and then seeing he's Lord, that he's the governing factor of your life. No, friend. If you need a person to change in your life for you to be okay, you've made them Lord if their name's not Jesus. I don't need anybody to change. I didn't need my wife to change. I loved my wife and wanted her to change for her sake because she has a destiny. But if I'm waking up for my wife to love me, I'm sorely miserable and I have a big vacuum and now I'm going to fall apart or break down in time. But if I wake up to shine and to love, she ain't costing me a thing. She's making a draw on the very motive I live by. Yeah. You get it? I hope you get that. It's called following him. I'm not being sarcastic. It's called following him, not singing to him. We're good at singing to him. I think he'd rather us follow him. Oh, I might get in trouble for this. You can hold an all-night worship. And if you ain't following him, you entertain yourself more than likely. Why do you have to do an all-night worship if you're not following him? Following him should inspire an all-night worship. You're not all-night worshiping to prove something. You're all-night worshiping because you become something and you see something. And and worship begins when the nature of God is revealed. Yeah. You're not trying to draw his favor. You have his favor. He sent his son. I hope you caught that. I hope I didn't get in trouble over that one. So the wicked works that were in our mind was self-centeredness. Jesus said, if you come to me, deny yourself. Now watch this. 
So yet, 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 while we were in this wicked place, why am I reading this? Because I want you to see how God sees you. Because if you don't see how God sees you, you won't be empowered to go be with him when you're alone. Sometimes the closest people get to the person of God is in a corporate setting where there's a corporate anointing and synergism and music and whatever. And they come to those settings because it makes them feel close to God. Because when they're alone, they don't go to him. They feel blocked. They feel self-conscious. They feel unworthy. And they don't have that communion and fellowship. That's why a lot of people like to come to altar calls and get touched by God and be filled and fire and, and feel God. Sometimes all they're doing is like, wow, he's still there. Wow, he's still touching me. Wow, he still cares. Don't ever, ever, ever come to an altar for that reason. Stand in your seat or in your spot and lift your hands and be your own altar call and say, I believe you love me or you never sent your son. And I know you're not disappointed and angry. And even if I have some conviction right now that I haven't been in these last couple of weeks and I've been taking for granted some things, man, my conviction is before me, God. And I'm asking you to continue to father me and give me. And all of a sudden, you're communing with God. You're setting straight your heart. And you're, yeah? That's relational. Instead of wearing fig leaves or pre presenting yourself to be in something that you know in your conscience you're not, right? So watch this. Yet now he has reconciled. Who's the initiator? He didn't say your mind or my mind changed. He said while we were living this way, he made the move to reconcile. Yet he has reconciled us. This is a big deal. This is God Almighty. Like he must really, people get mad at this, but watch this. He must really think a lot of what he made man to be to do what he did through his son. You go to a car lot. Guys, you know this. You know this. You go to a car lot. They got 15.5 in the window. You Kelly Blue Book it. You think, man, they're, they're, in, the, they're in the zone. They're being pretty fair. It's Kelly Blue Book. It's 15.4. They're asking 15.5. They're pretty well, and it is immaculate. And you're looking at Kelly Blue Book. Guess what you still do? You try to get them to absorb your taxes, your transfer fees, and you bring them down at least 1,000, maybe 1,500. And say, I'll tell you what, I'll buy it for 14. 14 if you cover my... Right? You're not going to go in the car lot and it says 15.5, Kelly Blue Book at 15.4, and say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 16.3. That's a nice one. <laughs> Ladies, you find it, it's like the most beautiful outfit, and you're like, whoo, it's a little high. Whoa. But man, wow. And all of a sudden you think, you know what, I can spend this for that. What I'm getting out of what I'm spending, yeah, it'll be, it'll be all right. But you're not going to go up and offer them another time more than that. Why? Because you set a worth on it. And you're only content to pay a certain amount for what you believe it's valued at. Why doesn't anybody teach the cross that way? Why my whole childhood you just make it about my sin and my depravity? When once I actually see, who knows that he can put a new heart in you and you're not wanting to sin. You don't wake up to miss the mark. Who knows that that can be true? If Jesus said that the pure heart shall see God, pure in heart, there must be a possibility of someone having something that he's calling a pure heart. So no one ever preached the gospel to me this way. Nobody said that Jesus saw the value that humanity possessed when it was surrendered, submitted, and in its created value, filled with Holy Spirit. Nobody ever said that. We're not making much of man. We're making much of him. He made man with intention. And he's determined to fulfill that intention no matter what the cost. Because he knows what the product looks like. Christ in you. That's intense to me. They always just said he died because of my sin. Nobody said he died to redeem my value and restore the truth about my life. And that's what Holy Spirit showed me in the bedroom. I promise you that's what he showed me. And that's what set me on this journey. And I started to see the whole gospel and all the scriptures through that one truth. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. And you could discern all the scripture and not have to throw any, out, any away. You know how people define a scripture, but then what about these two scriptures? 
You look at the New Testament and read the whole way through, knowing that God restored you back to love, back to his image, and paid a price to redeem your value, and every scripture makes sense and explodes in your heart. (laughs) And all of a sudden, you actually have true joy in your Christianity because it's good tidings of great joy. So the joy flows out of the good news that you see and understand. It's not happy, sad. There's a joy, the joy of your salvation. It's actually joy unspeakable. Settle down, brother. You don't understand. Yeah? And it's not a flaky thing. I understand it can be. I can understand it can be a put-on thing. But Scripture says it's the joy of your salvation and it's good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So make sure you're all people. You with me? So he reconciled us. How did he do that? In the body of his flesh through death. So Jesus did this while we were yet sinners, while we were alienated with twisted minds and motives. Are you with me? He reconciled us. Haven't we our whole lives stayed away from people until they changed? Oh, come on. I got (laughs) you. You know, well, yeah, but you can't tell me that they don't just get on your nerves. You run that by Jesus and see if that fits. <laughs> see, you're supposed to get new nerves. Well, you still got the old ones. The old bias, first impression, read the room when you walk in. Instead of see it for the value it has. I can show you in 2 Corinthians 5 where you don't judge any man any longer according to the flesh. But you see every man for his destiny, his potential, and his value. Watch this. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you. Oh, my goodness. You guys with me on this? Does anybody turn to this? It's Colossians 1. Or did you give up on me and think I'm never going to read it? (laughs) You might as well repent and get there because we're there, man. You're going to miss it now. We waited all this time. Colossians 1, verse 21, 22. And 23, watch this. In the body of his flesh, through death, why? To present you. This is the same you, you who were alienated enemies by the wicked way your mind worked. Yet now he has reconciled you through the body of his death to present you, same you, holy, blameless, And above reproach, where? In his sight. Ah! (laughs) I think you ought to be with him. I don't think you should be bashful. I think you should come boldly into the throne. Not arrogantly, boldly into the throne room of grace. If you see that Jesus, the high priest, he's passed through the heavens and he's the son of God, is sitting there mediating at the right hand, you probably ought to come boldly into his presence. Are you with me? Look, holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. This is how he sees you through the blood, through the resurrection for your justification, right? The blood that speaks what? Better things than Abel's blood that marked Cain for the rest of his life. Are you with me? It's, It's all here. Holy, blameless, of our in his sight, but this is where faith comes in. Watch this, watch this. If indeed, uh uh-oh, sounds like a little proviso here, a little condition. If indeed you, you, same you, continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, watch this, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel in which you heard. Sad thing is you go to church your whole life and never hear this hope. But you're hearing it, and I believe you've heard it. But you can go to church your whole life and never hear this hope. Just that you're always a sinner, you're always going to be a sinner, just be glad you're forgiven, and hopefully by the skin of your teeth, you'll be in heaven when the trumpet blows. Stay faithful in church and bring your tithes too. Maybe you'll make it. Isn't that what a lot of us were brought up with? That's what I grew up with. I grew up with, he died on the cross because you're a sinner. And I'm like, 
I'm little and I'm looking at the cross scenes and I'm watching crucifixion movies. I'm thinking, that's incredible. And he's all beat up. But they're leaving me the same. And then they say, make sure you stay in church because you don't want to not be in church when he comes. And I'm thinking, I wonder if he comes and there's no church service. Because <laughs> I'm little. I don't know. And then you tell me all these wild Bible stories in children's church. Like, you really tell me some crazy stuff, man. <laughs> crazy stuff. Guy sitting in the belly of a whale for days, gets thrown up, and he's fine. Doesn't even have acid burns from the whale. Little boy just swung a sling and killed a giant. I'm like, come on, what? <laughs> so you teach me this stuff when I'm a little kid, and then when I get old enough to believe it and stand in my situation, you tell me to use wisdom. <laughs> in fear and self-preservation. <laughs> it's just funny what we do. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'll back out. I'm backing down. I'm sorry. No, no, I can't. Come on. I make this comment, and somebody really wrote me a long email, and they made sense in their heart. But they, I'd made this comment once. I shouldn't make it again. I'll get another email. But I said, and it was a good email. It was just compelling me to be honest. I said, the way I don't even preach how I live from the pulpit, because everybody would say you have to use wisdom. I don't even preach how I live from the pulpit, the way I actually live in everyday life. I don't preach it because people would try to do it if they respect me instead of see it and become it. And other people would say, well, now, brother, and it would just create this big debate. Like, well, you got to use wisdom. God is this and God is that and God's given us this and that. And like, I'm not putting anybody else down. I'm just telling you I don't preach how I live. I've never shared it from the pulpit in detail. I'm not against any of these things that we go to. I just believe the gospel. And it's working really well. I'm just going to go with God. <laughs> yeah. You get it? So now I really opened up a can of worms. Oh, <laughs> Lord Jesus. No person wrote me an email. I made this comment, and they said, aren't you a teacher? Shouldn't you be sharing these things? Should you give us the opportunity? To, I think you should reconsider it. I, so now I did it again. I'll, please, honey, don't send me that email. Because <laughs> it was well-written. She wasn't angry. She was, she was hungry. I remember when witchcraft came at me years and years ago to try to crush me and stop the momentum of Christ in my life. Witchcraft. Witches in my town praying curses, and the Lord even showed me it was voodoo against my life. And I was the only one in our church who was chilling and saying, hey, you ought to be glad they're coming to church. Like, don't be afraid of them. Why do we got to go downstairs and hold hands and pray in tongues? You're just showing you fear them. You fear what they stand for. Or you should just be excited they're here. Go give them a hug. But you know what they were doing at night? They were coming, they were taking human urine and pouring it on the door handles of the church and doing chants and curses. And they, they saw where my heart was and what I was preaching. And I don't know what was going on, but it was one of those things like stop the momentum of this. I, I was ready to sit down all the teenage boys in youth group and talk about telling them to stop peeing in the ivy. I'll back. I thought they were using a quick escape. Just, you know, a boy, just a little more complicated for a girl to go in the ivy. But a boy can pull it off. And I'm like, these guys should be using the restroom, not the ivy. Because you'd get around the back door and all you smelled was pee. And we realized it was on the door handle. And then all of a sudden this witchcraft stuff starts hitting my body. All my friends freak out. People that love me and respect me. People I look up to. They're all, how can this happen to you? You understand righteousness more than anybody I know. How's this door open? And they ask all the questions that you're never supposed to ask. You're supposed to stand in what you know. See, John the Baptist asked a question he already had the answer to when he was in trouble. There was no one on the earth that had a better revelation than he. But when he was in prison, he asked the disciples to ask a question that he already knew. And Jesus said, blessed is the man who's not offended because of me. And then he esteemed John. And told us even the least in this kingdom would be greater than he. Ain't that something? So all my friends, I, I would love to tell you a different story. I didn't have one Christian relationship and leadership that understood the witchcraft and agree with the stand that I took. 
So they all sat me down in a community meeting, like all of them and me, and told me I was in spiritual pride and that I didn't want to lose my testimony or my message and that I needed to get help. And I said, it's witchcraft. I, what do I need help for? It's witchcraft. <laughs> I got all the help I need. <laughs> I wouldn't trade that season in for a thing. Man. Three times that thing came and tried to kill me. And I thought I was dying one of those times. It really seemed like I was dying. You know what I said while I was losing breath and passing out in front of my family? I said, well, why weren't you in the emergency room? You need to use wisdom. You need to calm down. Because it was witchcraft. I'm just not sure we're ready for this kind of warfare. If we're not careful, we love our own lives a little too much. I think we ought to love him a little more. Because you're looking at a man that understands he ain't never going to (laughs) die. It's just a powerful revelation. I'm in the south there. I got cops sitting around me because there's a death threat on my life. Isn't that ridiculous? Because somebody doesn't like what I'm preaching. And if he comes and preaches, he's not going to make it out of there. He's going to (laughs) die. And I had to dismantle the policemen. Because I said, this isn't your fight. I appreciate you. There's a place for you in society, but you're in the wrong place. <laughs> this is spiritual. It's intimidation. And if you don't face it, you always run from it. I said, so let's let it play out. They said, they're going to kill me. Let's see if they can. <laughs> and I dismantled it. And he said, I don't agree with you, sir. I said, I'm not asking for your agreement. Please honor my request. And they dismantled the whole thing. And I hung out late and I stayed like I did last night. And I was one of the last ones to leave. I drove myself to where I was going and I took myself home and you can see I'm fine. It's amazing how people that don't have that revelation then they say, well, brother, you should have used wisdom. What about your family? What about your children? I think God already has all that understood. And I think they already understand I'm in this thing for keeps and I'm surrendered. (laughs) I'd rather die in faith than live in fear. That's just me talking. That's me. That's just me. But I remember I said something in the Holy Ghost when I was dying of witchcraft. It felt like I was dying. I couldn't even stay awake. I was losing. I had more more pain in my body than I thought you could humanly feel. There's no way to describe it. (laughs) And I said, Holy Spirit, would you take my face to the Father and ask him to look to the right and he'll see why I have a right? That's what I said. It just sounds so profound. Jesus came and delivered me. It was the most dramatic probably thing I ever experienced in the Lord. I don't talk about this stuff. You can watch countless hours of YouTube and you don't hear me talk about manifestations. and stuff. But my ceiling opened up. And a waterfall was pouring out of it. And it was splashing on me. And when that thing ended, it was like I never experienced a trace of witchcraft in my life. It was like I've always lived in the presence of God. I can't even explain the rejuvenation and the thing I experienced. It was off the hook. There's no human words. Well, that was just emotion. Stop. (laughs) The Lord said, bless your wife. Because they went all through it with me. They all went through it with me. They came in that day when it looked like I was dying and they ran to me to pray around me and surround me and pray. And I was just staggering through the house, leaning on the wall going, as the deer pant for water. Couldn't even sing. My daughter at night came down to help me and stand with me. And she said it was so overwhelming, the atmosphere of demonic stuff. She ran to a bedroom and cried. We walked through that. You see why I'm like this? Because I don't have a theology. I've walked with Jesus for a while by the great privilege of grace and God. And went through some witchcraft stuff and it made me what I am today. It made me learn how to not fear and be afraid because he really is Lord. I don't need Shadrach's story. I appreciate it, but I got my own. (laughs) Not afraid of trials. I'm not picking a fight. I'm not picking a fight. But you go ahead and squeeze me. Because you're going to get Jesus. Are you following me? It's it's a little on the intense side. I get it. But 
It's truth. It's how a Christian lives. You read Hebrews 11 and see if I'm not right on that. How they were sawn in two and how they suffered so much for being Christians. How they were in caves and places. It says whom the world was not worthy. All these people lived that way, not even receiving what they were believing for and living for because the day didn't come yet. We're in that day. I think we could show every bit as much integrity as those patriarchs. Let's not get soft in America. Let's not cushion the message and make it all about me getting something and being protected. I'm so protected it's ridiculous because I'm standing in eternal life. You get it? I don't know how I get here with you guys. I think it's your fault. <laughs> I don't know. Somehow I think you want this. <laughs> if indeed you continue in the faith, you're going to stay holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let me paraphrase what he's saying. He reconciled you and me through the body of his death to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach if we keep believing it and don't let anything change our mind. Amen. That's what he's saying. That's your place every day, waking up a son in your heart. Consistency. None of this. No up and down, moody, just not feeling it, brother. No, no, no. You wake up and you're just not. Who's ever woke up and you could have used another hour of sleep, maybe two? Whoever woke up and said, man, I sure don't want to go to the job that I have to work right now. And if you're not careful and you don't live by the Spirit, that thing starts to overwhelm you. Next thing you know, that thing dictates your mood, how you respond to your spouse, your attitude while you're eating breakfast and rushing out the door. It affects you when you come home because it was a long day and it was just like you expected because you didn't feel like going in the first place and now you're a little moody and grumpy and you expect her to understand because, hey, cut me a break. You don't have to go through the place I have to go through every day. It's a hell hole. Come on, people talk like this and then they justify their, their mood. I promise you that can all go away in the bed when you're laying there and you wake up and understand you're a son no matter how your body's feeling. You could use another two hours sleep. I agree. I understand. There's mornings for all of us like that. But you don't let that stuff dominate your life. And you trust God and you trust grace and you look up and nobody's even listening. It's just you and God. Wow, thank you for today. Man, I appreciate your grace in my life and I appreciate God for just wholeness and fullness. And I thank you for my job I used to dread. Man, I used to dread working beside Johnny, and now I see Johnny just needs your love. Man, I used to despise my boss. If my boss knew who he was, he wouldn't live the way he lives. Man, I'm so glad I get to work there. That sure beats just praying for a Christian job. Wondering why you never get one. I'll tell you why, because God has bawled and changed you to the one you're at till you get a revelation. <laughs> so we're not going to let anything change our mind. So who are we when we wake up in the morning? Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Now here's the thing that I don't know that we understand as much as we should. Some pastors are afraid of preaching righteousness because they think it'll give people permission to sin. It's the total opposite if it's preached clear. If I'm keeping my eyes on holy, blameless, and above reproach, it convicts me and convinces me that that's where I live. So it exposes everything contrary to holiness. It exposes everything that's of the flesh. That's why to live in righteousness is to produce its fruit to holiness. Oh. Romans... Romans 6, we might as well just look at it quick. There's a teaching I do. I love to teach a bunch of scriptures and piece them all, build a big old storyline because you can't get away from it. I go into Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 talks about the law, a shadow of things, just a shadow of the good thing to come. Wasn't the very thing because if it was, wouldn't they have been ceased to be sacrificed? They're just killing all these little lambs and turtle doves and bulls. And Just think if that was your pet. Just think if you lived in that day. You'd see how much you love your kitty. 
We'd be shutting off the computer and carrying little kitty down into the basement. <laughs> It'd be a bad scene, man. Little Hammy's the only pet left. He's up on the wheel. <laughs> he sees you get on the computer. He puts his little feet against the glass. His eyes twitching. He's like, nobody that goes down them steps ever comes back. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're on your computer. You get the little pop-up. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Click. Little Hammy, there we go. Can never make you perfect. Those sacrifices were a reminder of sin every year. That means Jesus doesn't want us reminded of sin. It says if those sacrifices were sufficient, the believers, the the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. What the first couldn't do, the second could do. It says it right in Hebrews 10. That means the goal of the gospel is to get you free from the consciousness of sin where you let the battle be won by his blood and you live in the victory called righteousness. That's designed to put integrity in your life and diligence and restore the things that were lost through the fall of man. So we got to preach it clear. Romans 6 is, is, is amazing. Remember how I said, look, I'm not against you praying the sinner's prayer with people. I think it's just a cool tool, but make sure you give them the whole story. Make sure you talk to them about water baptism. Just don't do street corner prayers. If if they're talking to you, get water baptism in the scene. So that they understand they're dying to live. They're dying to something so they can live to something. They're not just praying a prayer to go to heaven in case they die. Why would we just give that tiny little snidbit and call that born again? There's no place in the book of Acts they preached the gospel and didn't preach water baptism. No place. You can't find one place where the believers weren't baptized immediately because it was part of the message because the message was transformation, not go to heaven. Sanctification, set apart. Come out from among them and be ye separate. I'll be a God unto you and you'll be my people. Are you with me? Not one place in the book of Acts you'll find believers where they weren't baptized. Where it wasn't in the what men and brethren were cut to the heart. What should we do? Repent and be baptized, all of you, for the remission of your sins. Even in Cornelius' household, when Holy Spirit got zealous and excited and fell on him before they were even water baptized, boom, and they're all praying in tongues. And Peter said, Look, who can forbid them water since they've received the same spirit we've had? And they all took them all to the water. It was the first thing on Peter's mind. Let's get them in the water. Die to live. Die to live. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It's cool. So here we are at the end of Romans 5, and sin's abounding, and where sin abounds, grace what? Does abound much more. So then Paul's writing, he's writing in in chapter 6, he says, what then? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so grace may abound? Certainly not. I have the New King James. I like New King James just because it's not the thou shalt, wilts, and wilt nots, and thou nots. It's not the Elizabeth in English, but it says the same thing. It's just in English terms. So I like the New King James. So whatever version you like, that's fine. But the New King James says, certainly not. Some Bibles say, of course not. Let it never be. There's a lot of different translations that say the same thing. Watch this. Shall we say then, let's continue in sin so grace abounds? Certainly not. Here's his reasoning. How? See, nobody taught me this growing up, people. Watch. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? He's not talking about perfection. Stop freaking out over that, right? He's saying the identity of sin, the stain of sin, the memory of sin, just being identified by sin. How shall we who what? Come on, this is not my sermon. I'm reading it right out of the Bible. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Watch. Or do you not know? Well, some of us just don't know. So it's important to know. So Paul said, you know what? I'll take care of that. Some of you just might not know this. Do you not know? That as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. What does baptized into his death mean? You'll see in verse 10. He leads up to it, but he mentions it three times in a row. So it's a big deal. Baptized into Jesus' death. So when he died, I died. When he rose, I rose with him. 
You get it? Yeah. It's like so good. So do you not know as many of us were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall be raised in the, or walk in the newness of life. Does that sound like a new creation? Yeah. yeah. All things becoming new? Nope. All or some? All. So you think he's talking about motives? Will? Why? You think? That's where we need to realize. He's changing the whole person. He's changing the what makes you tick. The why behind your life. If that doesn't change, how will you change? If he doesn't change your perspective, how's your life going to change? If the eye is the lamp of the body, and as a man thinketh, so he is, then these things are important. So you have to have a what? A single eye. Your eye has to be single. Not wide view lens, not multiple choice, not yell, but, what if, well, yeah, you know. No, the way, not a way. The the gospel fun. Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so you're going to walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, so this is three times he said this in three verses, so we're going to find out what that means. Then certainly, so it's not just about dying, it's about living. Certainly, if we died in the likeness of his death, then certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Do you hear the synonymous? Do you hear as and just like? Do you hear how he makes us one? Did you ever notice how Jesus makes us one with him all the time? Like when the Bible exalts Jesus to the highest degree, he'll say, you therefore. He's like name above every name, heaven and earth. Everybody's going to bow. Earth, under the earth, above the earth. Every tongue's going to confess. You therefore. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah? Do all things without grumbling, without complaining. Why? So you can be revealed and seen as innocent children in the midst of a twisted world that's not living that way. Whom you, shining forth as a light, hold forth the word of life. That's scripture. It's Philippians, and it's amazing. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now go in my name. <laughs> he comes into his disciples riddled with fear, afraid they're going to get crucified like he was, hiding in a room, afraid. He comes walking in and says, peace to you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. <laughs> As the Father sent So I send you. For God so. Love. Gospel's amazing. <laughs> okay. So we're going we're gonna to be united together in the likeness of his death. We're going to be found in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this. There's another time you better know. Knowing this. That our old man. Our old man. He was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. He uses the word slaves a lot here in this chapter. And in almost every case, the, the word slave means bound and chained to serve one's will. There was a time we were bound and chained to sin to serve its will. We were once a slave to sin. Don't let any Bible teacher tell you that you're still a slave to sin. Because it's not what the Bible teaches. He doesn't write to the sinners of Ephesus and Colossae and Philippi. He doesn't write to those who are about to miss it any minute. He writes to the saints. As a man thinketh, so he is. It's a big deal to believe this because it's how you receive grace to walk in what you believe. And it's how your life changes. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be a slave to sin. Now watch this. 
See, I can't speak for somebody that prayed a prayer to go to heaven, but I can speak for a man that gave his life. For he who has died, died what? To himself, to his own will, his own ways, to his own life, to rule in his own life. He who has died has been what? Uh Uh-oh, wait, is this in your Bible? Is this just in my Bible? Do I have a wrong version? You have been made what? You have freed from what? Sin. Now, wait a minute, brother. You're always going to sin. You're probably sinning now. You just don't have a sensitivity to perceive it because you're so far from the holiness of who God is. You've got to have sin right now, right? Isn't that what people say? Do you hear people talk like that in the church? What are you saying, Pastor? You're perfect. You better be careful with your message. That's borderline heresy, man. You're blaspheming. Everybody sins. You probably sin today. Do you ever hear people talk like this? He who has died has been what? Freed from sin. sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? See, it's not just dying, it's living. And that's the fun part. Knowing, third time you better know, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now, here's the death we were buried into in baptism. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives unto God. Connectivity, making us one. Likewise, you, 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 also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present yourselves as members of of an instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yourself, but you yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law. You're under grace. See, there's where, there's where People are afraid to preach righteousness, but watch what Paul says. What shall we say then? Because we already covered this in verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? (laughs) Because we're not under the law and under grace? Should we just go ahead and sin? Certainly not. We already settled that. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself a slave to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. What's he saying? How you see yourself and what you believe about yourself is exactly what you'll produce. You know them by their... The eye is the lamp of the... As a man thinketh, so he... You see why it's important to preach this? Because people that believe outside of this and they see themselves as less than what he paid for will never walk in what he paid for, even though it's there. Guilt, condemnation, shame, three major tools of the devil. Never God. Never God. He never subcontracts it out. It's never the Lord. The Lord never uses those three tools, guilt, condemnation. They're anti-finished works of Christ. Guilt, condemnation, shame. You know what guilt says? Guilt says, I'm not forgiven. Well, I don't feel forgiven. Well, I still feel guilty. Well, I feel dirty. Well, I don't know. You know what condemnation says? My life's worthy of judgment. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge you. I came that you might be saved, but you will have my word that will judge you in that day, John 12. Yeah? What's shame? What's shame saying? Shame saying what I'm ashamed of is still who I am. Still me. That's why I'm ashamed, because I believe it's still me. You see how they're all three anti-finished works of Jesus? And they all suppress the finished work. Don't you yield to any of those three ever. They're the tools that the devil uses constantly on Christians. Guilt, condemnation, shame. Come on. The Bible doesn't say when you sin. It says if you sin and stumble. Don't be dismayed, discouraged, and throw in the towel. You have an advocate, Jesus the righteous. You run to him. Don't run from him. Run to him. You with me? Okay. I'm closing this up. I got to be done here. Was it four o'clock my time or am I past my time? Did I blow up my time? Oh, serious? Let's stretch this out. No, we'll be good. No, when I'm done, no, when I'm done, I'll be done. I'll be done here soon. Soon. A day is a thousand years, thousand years a day. Soon. Soon. 
Two more generations will pass on the earth. We'll still be sitting here. <laughs> no, we would probably miss it if we did that. We would definitely miss it. Wow. Present your members as instruments to righteousness. Phew. Where sin won't have dominion over you. You're not under the law, you're under grace. Don't you know that whoever you present yourself to obey, you're that one slave. Don't wake up in the morning and get on this holy mentality like, okay, I'm going to get up this morning and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to sin. Wake up and enjoy being his son. If you wake up and try not to sin, you'll be sin conscious. You'll take a test that he never laid on the desk. You'll grade your own scores. But if you wake up and enjoy your his, it'll empower you to live like his. If you believe you're a son, your life will look like sonship. As a man thinketh, so he is. And all you're getting, get understanding. Are you with me? Yeah. We're destroyed for the lack of. So if we can get this thing, we can stop a lot of destruction. I mean, that's the fourth time he says, do you not know that you're a slave to the one you present yourself as? But God, be thanked that though you were sinners and slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart this form of doctrine to which you were delivered. See why I'm taking this time to preach all this? To make sure you can't never say this doctrine wasn't delivered. You can go to church your whole life and never hear this. There's certain churches out there that won't even agree with this, even though the Bible says it. They'll, they'll turn it and interpret it a whole other way based on human experience. And they'll let our lives be the teaching of the gospel instead of the scripture. And having been, oh my goodness, he's going to say it again. The Lord must be pretty secure. And having been set free from, wow, you became chained and bound to righteousness to serve its will. <laughs> so your only option in Christ is to wake up and be righteous. It's your only option. <laughs> you got one window to crawl through. <laughs> it's like the little porter on the plane, you know. You just got that one little window. That's all you got, squeezed through righteous. That's the only thing you're allowed to wear. My, my, my. He speaks in human terms because of the weakness of our flesh. Just like I use the airplane illustration, right? For just as you presented your members as a slave for uncleanness, believing that's who you were and that's what you wanted to do, right? And of lawlessness leading to what? More. So now, because everything's changed, present your members as chained and bound to righteousness to serve its will and its purpose is holiness. Here you are walking out holiness without biting your lip to be holy because you believe what the cross did. And you're starting where he finished and that's how you'll run well. If you don't start where Jesus finished, you'll never run well. You'll try to accomplish what's already done. You'll fight a battle he already won. Are you with me? So watch this. For when we were slaves of sin... You were free in regard to righteousness. Do you see how powerful that is right there? If we're marked with righteousness, then we can't be slaves of sin. So sin's not even in the conversation. When we were slaves to sin, we were free in regard for righteousness. So now that we're righteous, we have to be free in regard of sin. It has to be that way. Don't let anybody tell you any different because the Bible is saying this. I mean, is this that hard to understand? You just read it and go, whoa. And the just shall live by. So what fruit did you have in the things which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, third time, having been set free from and becoming a slave, chained and bound to God to serve his will, you have your fruit to holiness. That's the second time he said that, isn't it? And the end of that, 
everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You stay really close to that truth, and that'll keep you really close to him. Please talk to him like he's in the room. Talk to him like he's listening. Don't say, well, it never seems real. Stop. Just live by faith, talk to him, and believe he's in the room. Yeah? Yeah. Communicate these truths to him. Thank him for these truths. Put these truths on in faith and in prayer. I teach out of Colossians 3 all the time because it's a powerful chapter. It teaches you how to put off and put on. Put off and put on. It's a place of prayer. You put off the flesh. You put on the spirit. You put off the lie. You put on the truth. Colossians 3 would be powerful if you get some time to just sit and camp and read that and talk to the Lord about it and thank Holy Spirit that that's a working thing in your life. Yeah? Countless times when you weren't looking and nobody was around, I was down on my knees and just taking off and putting on and believing the gospel. I love that. I'm in my room with the door closed. I would turn the clocks to the wall in the beginning because I didn't want to be distracted by time because I wanted to get this. (laughs) And I didn't even know I was changing, but everybody around me was like, what is happening to him? (laughs) And I I went from someone that you you would give up on to someone that you invited to your church to preach. (laughs) And it's just funny how God can change our lives. Yeah? So who wants to live this way? Okay, now watch. There's a reason I said that. Watch how simple this is. That's the most important part of the whole sermon right there. Your yes determines what you're going to walk in. To become love, you have to be willing to become love. You got to take away the lines and the chips and, yeah, but well, you're telling me if and all the analogies that question love. You have to say yes to this message to even have the possibility of growing up into it. Are you with me? Your yes is vital. So I liked you, yes, because you even added a woo to it. (laughs) So you all are like, not just yes, you're like, woo. (laughs) So that's good news to me. And I just believe the things that we preach will become fruitful in our lives. Amen? Amen. Uh, Where's Tom? Who's coming up? Who's closing out here? He's just a shock that I'm finished already, isn't he? (laughs) You just caught Tom sleeping. Tom's like AWOL. Like he disappeared. He's like, ah, he'll go another 30 minutes. That's all right. He's humble. He'll come out and repent and say, I believed wrong things about Brother Dan. He'll he'll make it right. He'll make it right. Tom's a good guy. Tom will handle this. But I was going to ask you to stand, and then he's going to ask you to sit. But do you mind standing quick? Can we just uh, do what we did this morning? And the reason I say lift your hands to God, it's just a sign of yieldedness, surrender, submission, right? So, Father, we just stand and we yield to you and we lift our hands before you. We are honored to be here in you. For your word, let your word become life in us and fruitfulness in us. God, do a work in us by the person of Holy Spirit that will make all these these, uh, revelations and truths become reality in our lives. And God, I just thank you for marking every one of our hearts today that we would all pursue this truth and never grow weary in well-doing and never turn back, that we would go forward and become everything you paid for. I bless every person, every soul here, every mind, every person here. I bless with this revelation and believe, God, that you're going to mark us with the tenacity and the grace to never stop short of what you paid for. Not to strive, but to enjoy growing up into you in all things. So I bless this house, families, relationships, marriages. God, everybody we've touched and prayed for. Uh, for healing this weekend so far. We just thank you for the hand of God working in every situation in a mighty way. God, we receive it all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.